save me. The message, the text message I received was in all capital letters. My friend, a pastor in Tennessee, was screaming through his phone, save me. I was trying to have a restful Sunday afternoon, but this text message caught me off guard. What in the world is wrong with him? So I texted him right back, hey, what's, what's going on? And he shot right back. My wife has decided to overdo Christmas decorations today on a Sunday afternoon after I have preached all morning. Now we're having to decorate every square inch of our house inside and outside. And now she's having me assemble a big reindeer in the lawn. It's not even Thanksgiving, I said to him. This was last Sunday. It's not even Thanksgiving. He sent back, she doesn't care. It has to be done. It is all or nothing. That's what she keeps telling me. It is all or nothing. I could feel my own stress level rising just reading these text messages from Tennessee. But we all know people like this, don't we? Perhaps one of us, perhaps you are like this. You see the Christmas decorations go up in Walmart or Hobby Lobby in August and the rush begins. That adrenaline kicks in and you are ready. Everything has to be done. All you see is lists upon lists. You live for this and it's all or nothing. You have to be ready and the sooner the better. Or maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're like me. Maybe your rushing madness doesn't begin until this time of year, right after Thanksgiving. The anxiety and stress of Christmas washes over us as soon as that turkey leaves the table. And we are consumed by this holiday. And it feels like we can't breathe again until January. Black Friday shopping. Small business Saturday. Cyber Monday. Giving Tuesday. Always more to do, always more to see. This time of year is supposed to be filled with joy and peace. But instead, we have filled it with stress and exhaustion. We end up, end up existing, operating in a constant state of sleep deprivation. Especially if you've got young kids like me. We scurry around over scheduling ourselves and our families family pictures christmas parties pageants plays parades and every church event you can imagine we're running and getting nowhere we are hamsters on a wheel we're zombies what's worse is we say that all of this busyness is pointing us getting ready for christmas that it's getting ready to re- receive and welcome the coming Christ child. But it rarely is. Let's be honest with ourselves. It rarely is. As Advent progresses and the number of shopping days dwindles, creating a countdown that only stresses us out more. And we end up tuning out the things that matter in life. Like the clock in my living room that chimes every 15 minutes. I don't even hear it anymore. It just become part of the background noise of our house. Or the train horn that I would hear at all hours of the day as a kid growing up in Beaumont. Eventually, I stopped hearing it. It just became sounds of our house. Never waking me, but always there. To put it in the words of Scripture, we are asleep. We're exhausted, running through this season, trying to get ready. And and we're asleep, asleep to the things that matter. As children, when we first learned the stories of Advent and Christmas, we anxiously awaited for those big Christmas pageants at school or at church. But now, as tired parents and grandparents, we see these pageants as just one more activity. One more thing to drive our kids to. The reminders and signs of the season have just become one more obstacle to overcome. One more thing to mark off our to-do list. 
And this preparation for Christ's coming and the celebration of his birth ends up being like that drive home from work after a busy day. We get in our car in the parking lot at work. Next thing you know, we're in the driveway at home. And we have no idea how we got on I-10, let alone got home. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We're asleep at the wheel. No matter how much decorating and shopping we've done, we're still not ready. Not even close. This is why Jesus' wake-up call is so important as we begin our journey to Christmas. I imagine Jesus grabbing us by the shirt collar and giving us a good shake, forcing us out of our trance so that we might actually wake up and prepare, not just for Christmas, but for Jesus' return. Because here's the truth, we're not just careening toward this holiday or through this holiday season while asleep, we're also careening through life in general while asleep. So the scripture reading this morning, it, this warning from Jesus is a jarring wake-up call urging us to get ready. Scholars refer to this portion of Mark's gospel as the little apocalypse, which makes Mark 13 sound both cute and terrifying at the same time. But in order to truly understand what Jesus is talking about here and how it applies to our lives, we need to put it all in context. Context is everything in Scripture, including this one. Remember, Jesus is in his final week in Jerusalem. He has come into the city on Palm Sunday with shouts of Hosanna, with people proclaiming him as the king. But things have turned increasingly dark since then. Jesus has turned over the tables in the temple, throwing the money changers from the building. This, of course, enraged the Jewish officials who have basically spent the next several days interrogating Jesus. One day after a particularly heated debate with the priests and the scribes, one of Jesus' disciples makes a seemingly random comment, like a throwaway comment about the temple itself. Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings these are. This was perhaps a comment about Herod the Great's recent renovation and restoration of the Jerusalem temple. But Jesus didn't miss this opportunity to continue his criticisms of the religious officials. Do you see all of these great buildings, Jesus says? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. I can just see the Pharisees turning red with anger at this comment. This is the center of Jewish worship life, the center of Jewish identity. This is where God himself is said to dwell, and this man is calling for its destruction. The disciples, meanwhile, were stunned that Jesus would say something so ominous. So Peter, James, John, and Andrew, the first called disciples, pull Jesus aside once they get to the Mount of Olives and insist that Jesus explain himself. What you said was too weird, Jesus. Fix it. What did you mean by that? Tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled. But how many of us have asked that same question question of God. That same question of Jesus over the years. The cancer that won't go away. The divided family that can't seem to get back together. The pain and the hurt that won't heal. The forgiveness we can't seem to find. The money that is always gone. The war that won't end. Where is God? When are you going to fix this, Jesus? As a pastor, that's the question I get a lot. I hear about people praying for years and years for Jesus to come back to help us to fix everything. But here we are 2,000 years later and we're still waiting. When is Jesus coming back? We want things to get better. We want his promises to be fulfilled. But rather than giving us straight answers to these questions... 
Jesus launches into a full-blown discussion of the end of times, referencing prophecy particularly from the book of Daniel. He says that we will hear rumors of his return, that we'll see terrible things happen, wars and earthquakes and famines, but these are just the beginning. But then Jesus reaches deep into the Old Testament well of prophecy and tells his disciples, but in those days following the distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. It sounds like the Creator himself is going to take the very fabrics of creation and begin to pull the threads that hold it together and peel the entire thing apart. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? The sun goes out, the moon goes dark, the stars fall from heaven. This is terrifying. Where is the good news, Jesus? But to Mark's first audience, when he wrote his gospel at about 65 AD, the good news for them was that they expected, they just knew that Jesus' return was imminent any day. They could withstand the troubles, the persecutions they were facing because no one imagined Jesus would be gone very long. Surely he'll be right back, these first generation of Christians said. Then, five or so years later, in the year 70, when the Roman army absolutely bulldozed the temple in Jerusalem, not leaving one stone on top of another, they remembered this passage of Scripture. He's coming, they said. Jesus is coming any day. But the Romans won that day. The Jewish rebellion was crushed. And Jesus never arrived. That's when these early Christians had to grapple with the rest of Jesus' sayings in Mark 13. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, not the Son, but only the Father. Only the Father. Great, Jesus, you don't know either. So what are we doing here? But that's when Jesus sums all of this up for us with a warning and a challenge. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Watch. Be on guard. Be alert, be ready, be awake. Jesus insists that we can't just cruise our way into the second coming. Autopilot won't work. That strand of American Christianity that says, I've prayed the prayer, I believe in Jesus, I've punched my card to heaven, I'm good to go, isn't good enough. That's not going to work. Neither will rushing through life like we rush through Christmas. Instead, Jesus demands that we wake up and get prepared. No more sleepy, zombie Christians fumbling through life, just hoping to get our act together one day. No more disciples who've prayed the prayer but still live like the world. That's not what being ready looks like. That's what sleeping looks like. We've taken Jesus' command to actively wait for him and turned it into a lukewarm, passive lifestyle and baptized it as discipleship. And now much of the church is snoring when the Lord is on his way back. But that's the trouble, isn't it? We say with our mouths that Jesus is coming soon. We confess it in church every time we have communion. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. But our church discipleship programs, our mission programs, our evangelism programs, all act like we've got another 2,000 years to go. But we don't know that. He could come back today, at this very hour, 
We've lost any sense of urgency. And instead, we've adopted a form of passive waiting rather than the active waiting that Jesus calls us to. And in the process, we have poured water on the fire of the Holy Spirit, which has allowed us, which has caused us to reflect the world more often than we reflect the light of Christ. You know, one of the great preachers of the 20th century, Fred Craddock, once told a story about something that happened to him many years ago while he was driving by himself cross country. He had stopped at a small diner somewhere in the south to eat an early breakfast and to drink some coffee. He'd been driving through the night, so he was getting close to dawn, and he was feeling tired, so he wanted to stop, get some sugar, some caffeine, some calories, right? And as he waited for his breakfast order to come, Craddock spied a black man who had come in and sat down at the lunch counter of this diner. The diner's manager then began to treat this man with, this black man, with contempt, a type of contempt that was clearly born out of a deep-seated racism. The manager was rude, insulting, and demeaning toward his guest and customer. But as he sat in his booth a little ways from the counter, Craddock wrestled. He wrestled whether to say something to the manager, to chide him for his shameful, racist comment. Eventually, the black man quickly drank his coffee and ran out of the restaurant. Meanwhile, Craddock remained silent. I didn't say anything, he later confessed. I quietly paid my bill, left the restaurant, and headed back to my car. But, but as I walked through the parking lot, somewhere in the distance, I heard a rooster crow. He heard a rooster crow. Just like for the Apostle Peter, the rooster served as Dr. Craddock's alarm clock. Craddock, the great preacher and scholar of the 20th century, had been asleep that day, totally oblivious to what Jesus was asking of him. He was just rushing through life on cruise, and had stopped actively waiting for Jesus. And in that moment, at least, he was not ready for Jesus' return. So Jesus wakes us up again and again with rooster crows or with stars falling from heaven, urging us to be on guard against the powers of darkness that try to lull us back to sleep, that try to convince us that lukewarm boring Christianity is the way to go, when in reality, all that will do is make us miss Jesus' coming. Instead, our lives should be marked by preparedness, by actively waiting for the coming of our King, not by sheer busyness for the sake of busyness, not by going through the motions of worship and prayer, but by getting ready because the Lord is coming. Like we prepare our homes and our lives, to receive our friends and our families on Thanksgiving, cleaning the baseboards even, making sure all the sheets are clean, making sure all the food is prepared. We, clean, we prepare everything for our guests. So Jesus calls us to prepare our lives and our hearts to receive him not only in the manger in Bethlehem, but as the glorious king who returns to set all things right. Turn from sin he says. Grow in holiness. Love your neighbors. Forgive your enemies. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Speak up for the voiceless. Live as Christ and make disciples in his name. This is how we make sure that we are ready for Jesus' return, whether it's today or whether it's 2,000 years from now. Because whenever it happens, Jesus is coming. Hear me, Jesus is coming. God is going to tear open the heavens and come down once again to finish what he started, to finish his story of salvation. He is not done. He is not far away. Jesus is coming soon. 
And are you ready for it? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.